Hello and welcome to episode 111 of the Brass Junkies. I'm your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined, as always, by the effervescent, the talented, the patient, the gregarious. Move it along. Move it along. <laughs> Lance LeDuc. Lance, how are you? Impatient. We've been getting, uh, we've, we've had a few people ask us if we could make the intros longer. So I was just, I thought we could oh, start okay. that by, you know, by. <laughs> I mean, I'm really, really good. And my dog in the middle of the night, who is a dachshund, <laughs> stuck her head into the sleeve of my sweatshirt in a laundry basket and made herself paralyzed. So we had to extract the dog from my sweatshirt <laughs> sleeve in this, oh, I don't know what time. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. I too am feeling blessed. Uh, I saw the 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 schedule for the NHL Eastern Conference Finals came out, and I saw that there was a Bruins game at three p.m. on Mother's Day, which made me say some loud curse words because that's not really good timing. And then, because sometimes good things happen to decent people like me, uh, my wife said there is a concert I really want to go to, and it starts at three so and i'd like you to stay home with nicholas i was like i guess i can make that sacrifice so so we rocked mother's day all morning early afternoon and then evening and dinner and it was great but and i actually got to watch the bruins uh pour six goals on the uh carolina hurricanes formerly known as the hartford whalers but i've said too much we're only two games into the series i'm not that excited so actually i am but i'm trying not to be so um lance why don't you tell these beautiful people about uh, duquesne university you know, the Mary Pappert School uh, of Music at Duquesne University is a proud sponsor. I don't know if they're proud. They are a sponsor. They're a continuing <laughs> sponsor, and they've done it for multiple years in a row. So I'm going to take that as a proud. They're a proud sponsor. They're a proud institution. Making. I'm not sure if they're proud of their relationship with us. <laughs> but Fair. Well, no one's caught on. So um, you can uh, – there's some really awesome – uh, brass teaching and performance opportunities going on at Duquesne, and they have kindly sponsored this show. So we would like to encourage you to go down to the show notes, which you haven't done, you should do, because it's fun. And I put Easter eggs in there. And so if you'd use that as a play-by-play, this is an aside, you might find it entertaining. But in the links, you will find a link to a page that was created specifically for you wonderful folks who are listening right now. And it will tell you about all the goings-on at Duquesne that are going on. So please click on that. And very, very, very special thanks to Jim Attaboy Nova. It sounded like you said specifically instead of specifically. I started with a s and then I put a pause <laughs> and then I put specifically in. <laughs> You're like my five year old. He still has like a couple of words that he doesn't like prenzel. He puts an N in there for no apparent reason. So prenzel. Yep. Yeah, which is cute, so we don't correct him. So mm-hmm. um he uh you know, two words that he actually has no problems pronouncing are no and but. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, but like <laughs> he thinks you have no butt. No, that is I really weird. That's yeah. kind of a strange, strangely specific insult. <laughs> there are times because he takes after his daddy that if I said I had no butt, he would very angrily argue that I do. And if I said I did, he would very angrily ang- say that Ungle. I didn't. <laughs> All right. Uh, we want to thank Parker Mouthpiece for providing the hosting. No, we haven't even said who the guest is yet, have we? We just like launched right oh, yeah. into the ads. But um, yeah, it's a little known tuba player. He's only won eight international uh, <laughs> orchestral <laughs> auditions. I mean, other than that, he's not really all that well known. And in fact, his wife won't, as you're about to hear, won't let him take any more auditions because she knows he's going to win and then they're going to move. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she's happy there. That's funny. You know you're a badass when your wife doesn't That's want right. you to take any more auditions because it actually means that you're moving. Uh, yeah, today's guest is Tim Busby, who, as you're going to hear, is an, he's a, a great a great interview, great dude. And um, yeah, I was really happy that we unpacked the auditioning thing with him uh, because when you win that many auditions, it's not only because you play the tuba like him, although that's a big part of it. But um, yeah, he has obviously mastered the mental side of the um, of the orchestral tuba quest as well. And um, yeah, this this conversation was great. So uh, I want to thank Parker Mouthpieces still yet again. Look at this. They're getting two two plugs. Well, 
the first one was yeah, like point one five of a plug. Uh, for providing our hosting, Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hitz Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece and the Lance LeDuc Non-Artist Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. You can find yeah, out more yeah, at, yeah. at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And the very last thing, Thank you to everyone who has left a review and a rating on iTunes. We are up to 163 ratings on iTunes. We would love to make that 200. It takes just a second. And if you want to leave us a, a review, that's even more helpful. Or you can just leave us a rating, a star, uh, and then, you know, a star rating, and then just get out of there. So, uh, but thank you to everybody who has taken the time to do that and who shared the podcast with a friend. And finally, Patreon. I already said finally. The, this is the act- actual finally. Uh, Patreon. <laughs> com slash the brass junkies you have access to a whole bunch of bonus episodes and a whole bunch of bonus content that i won't i won't get into now but you can find out more at patreon.com slash the brass junkies lance is your is your is your heart and your mind clear um what <laughs> without further ado let's get to the interview with the man who is not allowed to take any more auditions tim busby Today on the Brass Junkies, we are joined by a tuba player. Are you sitting down? A tuba player who has won auditions in eight different countries. That <laughs> seems like a typo, but I have seen it. Uh, I've seen it written in many places, and I actually know that it's true. But it still seems like a typo. Tim Busby, how are you this evening? Very well, boys. How are you? We're doing all right. Fantastic. Yeah, we're doing. So for Lance and I, it's nine in the morning. But uh, but Tim, as you're about to hear, if you don't already know, he lives in Australia. And so, what time is it for you? Eleven fifteen in the middle of the night. Holy son of a gun! Crap. You should be in bed. There you go. Holy yeah. moly! Yeah. See, uh, we're we're paying him a ton of money for this interview. That's why he's staying so, oh, up so late for us. So no, actually, that's not true. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, he, no? oh, I'll see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you can, uh, if you're wondering, uh, that is, that is not an Australian accent. So, uh, Tim, where where are you from originally? Uh, originally from Texas. Whereabouts uh, in Texas? But it's, it's probably been East Texas, a little small town called Queen City, Texas, population 1,600. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's an art, arts capital of Texas, basically. <laughs> Uh, lots of famous tuba players come out of that town. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's actually where where that's where Sam Palafian is from. Uh, that's also where Gene Picorni's from. Yeah, it's like it's a bizarre coincidence. Yeah. Bill Bell, Bill Bell, <laughs> right? That's right. Tom Holtz. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's... Tom Holtz. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so how? Small, t- tiny little town in Texas. That's great. How did you get? How did you start playing the tuba? Uh, uh, well, I, st- I actually started on uh, country fiddle when I was about four years old. <laughs> that and, old uh, witch. Just, just played played by ear. Everything. My my uh, grandfather was a pretty good country fiddle player, and I always enjoyed listening to him play on um, all the holidays, Thanksgivings, and whatnot. And so uh, I started doing that, and then that led into uh, bass guitar. So I started playing a little bit of bass, and then. Uh, sixth grade band, you know, I went in there and I wanted to play drums. Took this little test and uh, scored 100% on it. So I went into my band director and she said, uh, well, Timmy, what do you want to play? And I said, I want to play the drums because, you know, the drummers get all the girls. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, she said, I have to tell you, you scored 100% on your your test, so there's no way you're playing the drums. I said, don't, Miss Miss Manning, I I need to play drums. And she said, no, you're much too smart to play drums. (laughs) So, and you'll like this. So she said, no, you're going to play the euphonium. Uh, (laughs) And I said, what in the world is the euphonium? (laughs) Exactly. The Mensa magnet that is the euphonium. Yeah, and then I never had a girlfriend after that for some reason. (laughs) 
<sighs> and then in seventh grade, I went to tuba because I was a pretty big boy and uh, they needed someone to march with a sousaphone. So they put me in this piece of metal and, and that's kind of how it started, but I hated it, man. I hated it all the way till I was, oh shit, probably 19, 20 years old. I, I kind of hated it. I almost, you know, just fought everything against it, trying to not become a tuba player, but huh. eventually it got me. So. I thought you were going to say that you hated it until you won your, your, uh, um, your audition in the third country. And that's when you started liking it. But, uh, <laughs> 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 No. <laughs> wow, that's and I love. I've never. No, I just, I just never. Go ahead. I just never really got into it. I mean, I, I lo- always loved music, but the tuba really just didn't do it for me until. Yeah, I was nearly twenty-one years old before I ever really started to practice or anything. I, I just never practiced, or you know, I, the first few years of college, I just wasted. To be honest with you, like probably most of you boys, but. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Rex Martin was just shouting at his uh, at his radio like, "Can I get a witness?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen to that. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> I have never heard anyone uh, describe uh, being switched to sousaphone as being put in a piece of metal. I like that. <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> that's pretty funny. That's pretty accurate too. I mean, yeah, you wear it. <laughs> it is all Yeah, you wear it, man. It's so yeah, did, strange, strange did the girls people. go <laughs> up or go the the number of like girlfriends go up or down when you switch from euphonium to tuba? Oh, yeah, well, I, I, I guess they went up, but it, it wasn't enough to even talk about. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a statistical anomaly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, my dear, are known as a rounding error. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I love you anyways. <laughs> Pretty much. So no, I did okay in high school. What <laughs> uh, what uh, what made you start practicing in college? Was there like a was there an event or was it just slowly growing up or what happened? No, I um I was like I said, I was a mess in college, man. I I made Ed Jones just absolutely insane a few times, just going in there, had all these, you know, big dreams and ideas all the time. I was going to go and become a fisherman in Alaska. And and I was going to one, you know, next month I would go and I was going to be a bass guitar player on a cruise ship. And, oh, I had all kind of bright ideas. And yeah, I was, I had a big party at my apartment. I, I lived with two other guys and uh this one guy he he loves classical music and he he always would go into my my uh, bedroom because i had the biggest stereo and he would put it on 101.1 the you know the local dallas um classical music station there anyway this party was still going on in the in the uh, living room and i i was in the bedroom and uh anyways i just laying in the bed and i flipped the you know reached up and turned the stereo on and and on comes this uh, live broadcast of Chicago Symphony doing Mahler Six. That'll do it. And uh, and it was it was I mean seriously like pretty much right at the beginning of the fourth movement. Mm. And you know and I didn't know who I was listening to or names of people or anything at that point. But I mean it obviously was Gene playing and and I heard that solo and I just laid there and just listened to the whole rest of that symphony and was just blown away man so i got up and put my pants on everything and walked out that <laughs> was that kind of party edit that out sorry. <laughs> yeah sorry about that that slipped out anyway. uh, uh, <laughs> i told you i had a yeah anyway, it's, again it's almost eleven thirty here at night so I, wait even anyway. even but, when you're gene so, corny and you play the tuba that well it inspires to people put pants back on not to take them <laughs> off <laughs> uh, yeah so I walked out of the, walked through the living room and went to the front door. Everybody's like, hey, Buzz, where are you going, Buzz? And I said, oh, I'm going to the music building to practice. And they all, you know, fell out laughing. I said, no, I'm serious. And I left and I went and broke into the music building and and uh, practiced all night long. And, you know, Ed, I remember Ed coming in. Ed Jones came in about oh, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And he, you know, never, you know, never witnessed me in a practice room. So he just kind of, 
opened up the door and of course the smell was just like you know booze and sweat and you know <laughs> the normal stuff that tuba players smell like yeah 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 and he was like what the hell are you doing i said oh ed i gotta talk to you man i gotta talk to you he's like oh well let me let me go open up my studio just give me five minutes and anyways i just went in and told him i said i know what i want to do i want to man i want to be the best tuba player ever he was like, oh, okay. Yep, sure. That sounds good. You know? <laughs> On a fishing boat? Off. <laughs> I thought, well, shit, I got I to gotta change his mind, man. So I just busted it, just busted my ass as hard as I could. And slowly I changed his mind. And, yeah. Wow. So then the, he, he believed me finally. That's an awesome story. I'm sure he's glad how that long until he was convinced. What? Sir? How long until he was convinced? Oh, you know, um, shortly after that, I, I um, uh, what do you say, rented or borrowed the the university's F2, but they had this Yamaha 822 thing. And uh, I never played F2 before, and I, I rented it out, and I went into the office and said, hey, Ed, you know this, um, this uh, three – Three something, three fury thing. Do you do you have that piece? And he was like, "You're talking about you know the three furies by James Grant." And I was like, "Yeah, that piece. <laughs> Can I borrow it?" And he was like, "He was like, what What do you need it for?" I said, "I want to learn it." He was like, "Yeah, okay." So he let me borrow, and I went home and learned the third movement that night, and and went back and played it for him the next morning. And I think that was the point. He was just like, "Oh shit, this guy's this guy's nuts, man." So. <laughs> Uh, Did you have your pants on while you learned the third movement, or or not? Oh, man, it, oh, it just depended. <laughs> get it, get it, oh. get it. <laughs> oh goodness, that's an insane story. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you heard Mahler Six on <laughs> at a party with your pants off. You heard Gene McCorney playing Mahler Six. And you then like and and something snapped in you and you bro- you broke in. Where would you you literally break into the school of music? Yeah, because you know, I mean, Texas A&M and Commerce at that at that point it was East Texas State University in, in Little Commerce, Texas, and you know I think the music building closed at ten o'clock every night and opened at you know whatever seven in the morning, eight in the morning. You know, it was it's it's an educational school. There's um, you know, very different than some of the conservatories and the big universities as far as the music program. So yeah, you, I just broke in, you know, found the door and got into it. <laughs> the, sh- the show note says pantless Mahler six leading to a breaking and entering incident and in the launch of his career. path. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that might be the best. In Wait, case you- <laughs> I'm sorry. Read that again, Lance. That might be your best show note slash Easter egg yet. Pantless Mahler six. <laughs> Leading to a breaking and entering incident and the launch of his career path. <laughs> it's a little. I'm just glad my kids are asleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my goodness, that's a little long for a, a biography title, but um, maybe that's the subtitle. I don't know. Like the the uh, the, idea, un- yeah. the unofficial Tim Busby story. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's uh, I like yeah, the condensed version. <laughs> that's uh, abridged. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think all of us need abridged versions just for safety. <laughs> um, so, uh-huh. that's so what, that's what you tell the people on the airplanes when you know you get by these uh, talkers who want to talk, and you just feed them that line. So, what do you do for a living? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pantless Mahler six yeah. listener, leading to a that's right. I'm the tube yeah. of my pants on. You want to see it? <laughs> <laughs> The tuba or your pants on? Oh, geez. Yeah. Uh, How about just a no? Um, the ding! So <laughs> <laughs> what did you – what about uh, Gene's playing? I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of his playing, so I'm just wondering if you can put it into words for us. Like what about Gene's playing did that you heard that night like made you go and do that? Like what had such a resounding effect on you? Oh, man. it's. Tr- I mean, you got to think about this. I mean, I – I mean, I didn't even know who Gene was. I didn't know who, you know, the Chicago Symphony was. I didn't know any of this stuff. So, um, 
it, it's really hard. I mean, I don't really know at that point what it was, but I mean, now, you know, I've studied Gene and, and, um, you know, I'm not as big of a dumbass as I used to be. I, <laughs> you know, I'm, Few of us are. you know, and, and just, and just know when, know when Gene's playing, I, you know, it's the color and the shape and the, the, you know, the emotion that he, you know, drew out of that. I mean, come on, pretty simple little solo, but mm-hmm. to take something quite simple and make it sound yeah. like one of the greatest things you've ever heard yeah. is, 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 is moving, you know, I mean, is, is for, for, um, even a country board from East Texas who didn't know shit from Sean Ola, you know I mean? Something, something stuck, hmm. obviously. Wow. Making the simple. Yeah. Beautiful. That's, um, that's probably the best way to sum up. Uh, I grew up listening to Chester Schmitz all the time in the Boston symphony and that's exactly, and he could play all of the tuba Olympic stuff as well as, as anybody I've ever heard, but it was just like the real, like hearing him play Brahms two was a treat, which there's not exactly a lot of meat on the bone there. And, but he could just say so much with so few notes. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's a great way to put that. So, wow. What a, what an experience, yeah. huh? I didn't, uh, I mean, most of us don't have like that specific of an origin story of like the moment that we snapped. So that's uh, that's pretty neat. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, long but I was so the guy here. Man, I was just uh, you know because at that point when I yeah, so you know when when it all kind of sunk in and I started doing research and and just soaking up as much as I could. One of the first things I realized is how far behind I was. Is, Everybody, you know, I mean, right. I mean, I mean, you take take my wife. I mean, she knew Jessica knew what she wanted to do when she was like eight or nine years old or something. So she's, you know, she's been working and you know working at it for that long, and you know, it's just like, oh shit, I gotta I gotta catch up. So it was just like overtime mode, you know, for you know years as hard as I could push. I mean, too hard, you know. Not like now. Look back, and it was just like quite stupid, you know, spending, you know, 10, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours in a practice room, you know, you take, you take everything, everything you need, you know, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and even a little flask, depending on how long you're going to be in the room. You know, the only reason you come out of the room is just to go and piss, you know, I mean, just overboard, you know, but I felt like at that point I had to do it, Hmm. but, you know, if I, if, again, if I was a little bit smarter and more mature, I could have did it a different way for sure. Hmm. So, so you go back to your apartment, and uh, how long you till these guys that uh, you were living with realized that you were serious? Because you had lived with oh. them. I mean, they knew who you were. They thought they knew who you were, and now all of a sudden, you're breaking into the music building in the middle of the night. Oh, it didn't take long. I mean, I've, I've yeah, I mean, I've always, you know, kind of. Uh, if I get focused on something, I, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, a little bit too focused maybe at times. And so I think once, once they started seeing me in the fracture room all the time, and I think they kind of knew. And then, you know, then you start winning jobs. Right. And I mean, at the, from that, that school, nobody was winning jobs, man. It was like, we had, they had, there were some incredible brass players, even at my, you know, the years I was there. I mean, it was like, Really good brass playing, great trombone department, great, you know, some other really good tuba players. And But, you know, it was it just wasn't that, that um, what do you say, that, that um, it wasn't a drive to win an orchestral job or, a, you know, a band job or anything like that. It was, you know, get a good band directing job and, uh, you know, maybe freelance here and there and everywhere. But it was, no one was going to take auditions and that kind of stuff, man. It just wasn't happening there. Well, so then how did you develop that skill? If that was not the culture there, then where where did that come from? Well, I mean, I think I, I mean, I just picked everybody's brain. You know, it, it was shortly after that, you know, I think Ed kind of had enough of me. You know, he said, you you know, you need to go study with Matt Good. Hmm. So I started going to study with Matt, and that was, you know, another eye-open experience. And and then, um, I then I, you know, shortly after that, so I was – almost 21 i was just about to turn 21 and i you know i was in the finals for new mexico and i was 
Then I won the uh, Air Force Band of the West job. I was too fat, though. You know, I was trying to lose all this weight and stuff. And I, I basically lost all the weight. The funny thing, I ate freaking bananas for freaking three months and, <laughs> you know, walked and ran and shit like that. And, and I lost it. <laughs> I, I, I lost all this damn weight. <laughs> and, uh, and then in uh, that tuba conference in the movie Minnesota, montage. What was, what was, was that a... 98 or something i can't remember in the one in minnesota uh that was 2000 like, uh, i took a left from anyway was it i, I don't know no, no i couldn't in 2000 because i was already in acapulco man okay All right. no i was already in chicago in 2000 shit no no so it had to be like 98 or something like that anyway because it was right before i won acapulco yeah anyway i took a left from mike sanders and you know, I, I was looking good. I was feeling good. I was about to, you know, go and join the Air Force. And and I, I played for him in this little tiny-ass room in, at the University of Minnesota, I guess. And, and he just looked at me. He's like, you just won what job? And I said, oh, you know, I just won this Air Force, you know, military band of the West. He's like, no, you're going to turn that down after this lesson. You're going to go call him, and you're going to go and study with Gene Picorni. And I was like, oh, I know that name. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, man. I just called, I called the Air Force band. I was like, hey, sorry, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to come. And they were like, oh, could you not lose weight? I said, no, I'm, I'm like four pounds away, but I've, I've changed my mind. <laughs> huh. <laughs> and then I, uh, he gave me Gene's number and I called him and then that's, you know, and then I started studying, going up to Chicago and studying with Gene. And yeah, and again, another life life-changing experience for sure hmm. so and then from there everything just kind of you know yeah it was it was awesome to be honest it was great well it's probably not this might be this might not be answerable so can you talk about so ed got you to what level and you felt like you could do that and then matt did what for you and then sort of gene was the final piece of the puzzle it sounds like can you kind of is it categorizable? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, Ed was, Ed is still. He's he was an incredible teacher at fundamentals like sound and, um, you know, just the the basics of the nuts and bolts of creating a, a big, beautiful sound. Ed Ed has a great sound too, you know. So just having hearing that sound in lessons was always really good. Um, and then when I went. To Matt, you know, Matt had, had at that point had the experience of, of um, you know, uh, auditions and excerpts, and he'd done it a million times, you know, because he'd been playing with the Dallas Symphony in Jacksonville before that and blah, blah, blah. So kind of get that ex- that experience of, of now you know how to create a, a nice sound. This is what you do with it kind of thing. And then when I went and started studying with Gene, finally, it was... It was, um, I mean, I think for me, it was perfect timing because the way Gene taught me, he ne- Gene really never talked about fundamentals and uh, concept of sound, blah, 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 this kind of stuff. He, we, he didn't give me a routine, you know. It was none of that crap. It was just, it was almost like a mutual, a mutual um, agreement, a relationship, trying to build a product, trying to build something that, you can sell, you know, and, and that was like the next level for me because it, it wasn't that Gene never said, this is the way I do it. And this is the way you should do it. It was never that kind of thing. It was just, this is the way I do it. What do you think? Show me how you do it. And then I would play it. And then it was like, you'd build this thing together. And it was just incredible, man, because at that point, so, you know, at that point I'm what, 22 years old or something. And, you know, I'm getting a study with, at, by that point, my, you know, one of my heroes and, and it was cool, but it was never like this whole crack in the whip kind of thing. I'm the, I'm the shit and you're a little peon. This is the way you do it. It was, it was, uh, it was awesome. Hmm. Hmm. So I don't know if that answered your question. But perfectly. That's, that's oh yeah. Like, perfectly and concisely. So how long then, or how long did you study with Gene before you start launching into gig after gig after gig? Um, when, let's see. I, well, I was playing a bit 
with the CSO shortly after I won the Civic and do a whole bunch of other stuff in Chicago. And I also had this full-time um, job at this, I think they went bankrupt now, but international music supplier. And um, just outside of Chicago, I was the brass specialist <laughs> of picking out trumpets and stuff for people, even though I can't play trumpet. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> Most of them can't either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And I could never figure out how to get my damn tuba mouthpiece and those those lead pipes of the horns and the trumpets. So I would just <laughs> guess which one was better. But <laughs> anywho, um, yeah. So I, I was pretty busy in Chicago, and then and then um, and then I won Singapore in two thousand one. So and that was a, actually a pretty hard decision for me because I loved it in Chicago, man. I was getting a you know, sub with Chicago Symphony. I was playing with Chicago Civic. I was, I was making pretty good money, getting lots of gigs everywhere. And, and then the Singapore job come up. And, you know, I was just I didn't know what to do. And finally, uh, Gene kind of after me just kind of beat on the fence for a while. He actually told me, "Oh, I think you should go." Hmm. And it actually broke my heart. I was I was devastated, man, because I was like, "Oh shit, why why do I want to go halfway? You know, on the other side of the world." It's a long ways. When everything's so good here. Yeah, man. And but I'm you know, I think if I would have stuck around in Chicago, mm. I would have I would have never been the player not to blow smoke up my ass, but never been the player that I have become today. I would have been somebody just following Gene's path, trying to be like somebody else, and at the end of the day, you know, you you get to the end of the road and you bump into somebody and you go, Oh, Shit, you're already here. You've already done all this. So, you know, so I think it was a, it was a good decision that, that I did go. Hmm. Wow. That, so what, well, so what, keep going. So how long, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Yep. I was just going to keep them on this path. So yeah. How long were you in Singapore? Singapore, 2001 to 2004. I, I loved it for the first six months. I hated it the rest of the time. Um, <laughs> it's just too crowded for me, man. It's just, it was just, you know, think Singapore is a really clean, nice, nice place. I think to live if you if you're the right kind of person. But being just a country bumpkin, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a transition. And being thrown into yeah. Oh shit! Man. This little tiny island with like four or five million people on it. No, you know, no, no space to do anything and. We've, uh, and the orchestra, one, I mean, there was good and bad in the orchestra. And the, the good thing was is that, you know, Singapore, there's not a, um, there's not, not much tradition as far as, you know, um, the way they play certain music and stuff like that. So it was kind of every man for themselves. So I got to learn and develop uh, concepts and, and styles and stuff like this, my own. And then, and then I guess 2004, I won, I won the, the job in Yavla, Sweden. So I moved to Sweden to Europe. And, and then all of a sudden there was all this tradition, uh, playing F2 on, you know, the Bruckners and the, the Brahms and the all, you know, even Nielsen and a bunch of stuff, you know, hmm. that I, I, didn't, thought, I didn't know that. Really? We, we're playing, F, we're playing F2 on, you know, but that's the way it was. And, and it, again, that changed for me, it changed everything because, now you know I can't I can't play the Master Singer on C tube anymore or Brahms two or a lot of these pieces because it just doesn't sound right to me, hmm. you know. Wow. So yeah, so you know then from from Sweden was great, and then uh, two two jobs in Sweden, and then yeah, while I was in Sweden, that's when I won a uh, Iceland Symphony. So I kept two jobs for oh, nearly a year. It was hell flying back and forth trying to keep both jobs because I didn't know what to do, which job to keep. And uh, Anyways, finally at that point, we decided to, Jessica had won a job in Malmö also and Iceland. So we decided Iceland just because the, the money was better and the orchestra was so, just such a fun orchestra, man. It was a bunch of Vikings just blowing the shit out of everything. It was awesome. <laughs> 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 that's funny yeah. a viking orchestra yeah. i like it i like it <laughs> oh man all heart and soul man just it, yeah 
Well, sure, talk to us so. about your wife a little bit. So what, uh, uh, for those who don't know, who what does Jessica play? What gig did she win? How did you meet her? All that good stuff. Oh, she, uh, let me go get another bourbon white. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> We're back to the pants on, pants off. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, so when I, oh, here's another guy I studied with, Dave Kirk, uh, Dave Kirk, man, he's, He's awesome. Yeah. Like I really always wanted to study with Dave because you know Dave and Matt Good are good friends. And so after I won Yabla, I had the summer off, and I, I just called Dave and I said, "Hey, man, can I can I just come and study with you for the summer?" And he was like, "Oh, well, um, I got a better idea. Why don't you uh, take the audition for um, Texas Music Festival, and uh, then you can just study with me for free for the summer." And I was like, okay. That is a better so idea. I this, yeah, I took this during a summer festival audition in one, and I was, yeah, and it was fun. You know, we did some good concert stuff, but I got to study with Dave, and, and that was awesome. And then um, shortly after I won that Yavla job, uh, a buddy of mine who I was in the Civic with calls me and says, oh, dude, man, you won the, the Yavla job. That's awesome. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And he said, man, do you know who plays principal trombone in that? That orchestra. I was like, no. He's like, oh, that's that's, you know, this girl named Jessica. Did you know her? And I said, oh, I've heard. Yeah, I've heard the name. Oh man, she's she's awesome. She's an incredible trombone player, and she's you know really good looking. <laughs> and I said, oh yeah. Well, at that point, I was married to somebody else, and uh, and I said, oh okay. Anyways, so yeah, this was like what year was that? It was two thousand four. I remember sitting in my. This may be one of these parts we may, may need to edit out. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I remember I, mean, I, mean, I remember sitting in this uh, this uh, my buddy's house, James Metter, the, the He's a bass drum player and composer. I was sitting in his house, and James was like, "Man, we got to look this girl up. Let's Google her, man." And so we, you know, popped her name in there, and you know, it was like. 2004, you know, like the internet, you know, it kind of loads page from the top, you know, like, you remember that? Like, it didn't, it's not like it is now, it just flashes up and it's all nice and stuff. It was just like loading slow, just from the top to the bottom. And man, slowly her face came into, you know, focus and everything. And I was just kind of like, oh, okay. And James leans down and whispers in my ear, he said, you're fucked. <laughs> 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 oh man, come on, man! That is not like that. And 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 damn it, he was right, man. So shortly after I got there, we yeah, we met and love at first sight kind of thing, and and uh, yeah, got together and it was it was funny because you know at that point she Jessica was a or still is a very well known uh, trombone soloist. You know she was in Christian Lindbergh's uh, Sextet Unit Two Thousand and and. Uh, you know, going and playing solos all over Europe and, and different things like this. And, you know, at that point, solos to me, you know, I played the Von Williams only because I had to for auditions, you know, and, and, and I mean, I, I don't want to say anything, you know, too bad, but, you know, you stereotypes sometimes are, are true, you know, and, you know, when I go to the States, I hear some of these kids in university playing the Von Williams and it sounds like they're playing excerpts, you know, it's just, right. it's not, it's not a solo, man. It's not. It's a total different world to play that than to play even the Singer or, you know, and however close you can find an excerpt that gets to the Vaughn Williams. It's still not the same, man. So, but that's how I was. I just played it like an excerpt. And, and, uh, and when I first heard her play, um, we, I went to Athens with her. She was doing a solo tour and, and she played this, you know, the LG, the rock model of LG. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, I was just floored by how expressive it was and colors, how she could change colors and, and shape phrases, little, just little nuances of everything she was doing. It was just so far and beyond anything I had thought about. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, shit, what have I been doing now? <laughs> and, then, and then the emotional connection the emotional connection that she was getting like old women, like crying and stuff during these concerts. And, uh, you know, then of course it makes me emotional. I start crying because, 
I see how much she's affecting these people because they have this emotional connection. And, and it just all started to kind of think in, you know, that I've, I've been doing something wrong for a long time. So, you know, and then to have, listen to her every day practice and to have that in my ear all the time, it, it was really helpful. Wow. A huge game changer for me I'm in more ways than one, of course, now, because we have this beautiful, big family and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, if we're just only talking about the, the musicality. It was, yeah, it was crazy. Well, it sounds like a pretty amazing partnership. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, it's like any partnership. There's, <laughs> there's ups and downs and, you know, we have to deal with them. Cause I mean, then you, you, you know, like she, she was extremely busy and I was getting busy. And, and then it's like this juggling, like you just don't, okay, whose turn is to go kind of thing. Well, what are you doing this way? Well, I'm doing this. And what are you doing? Well, I'm doing this. Well, which one's more important? Cause somebody has to have little kids and, <laughs> you know, it was just like, you know, you know how it is. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, there's uh, it's a pain in the ass, but it's worth it. And you've got five kids. Yeah, we got five, man. It's awesome. Uh, our oldest now is 21. He's a police officer, and um, the youngest is our little girl. She's 10. She plays trombone, and yeah, she's she's my heart, you know. Wow. So, how many countries has she lived in then? Uh, well, Melba being 10, she was born she was born in Iceland, so she's only lived in well you know we we took a year off what was it last year from melbourne and we lived in louisville for a year so i guess you could say she lived iceland uh america and now melbourne you know uh, australia yeah right that's going to be such yeah. an amazing opportunity for her well i guess all your kids have uh am i I'm guessing all of them have had a, a, a cool, weird, circuitous uh, path, which is, I think, uh, great for them. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it. I hope it's. You know, you worry sometimes about moving them around too much and whatnot, but I, I think at the end of the day, it's it's a good thing. So, if you had to live in one of the places where you've had a gig and it had nothing to do with music, there was no more performing. Where, where would you choose? Oh man! Well, you know, as, as I said earlier, I'm from I mean, I'm from Texas, so I mean, sure. I guess let's say really, I mean, other than Texas. Oh, Melbourne, man! Melbourne's a great city. I mean, it's an incredible city. You know, it's a cafe scene. You know, wine. You know, there's wine country all around the city, and yeah, it's an incredible place. Good beaches and. The only problem with Melbourne, man, is it's far away from everything, man. <laughs> it's like, right. like this, like this damn high tech. You know, I got to get on a plane and fly twenty hours to go and play for a bunch of tuba players. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not yeah. that there's anything wrong with that, I guess. But that's a, you know what I mean. Yeah, that's that's a long ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, so it was kind of cool last year, you know, being in the states for that year because you know. You just you know you get invited to go here there and everywhere and you just you get in the car or you jump on a little flight and you're there in an hour or so it's like it's a total different total different world right right how do you travel with your tuba or tubas do you have flight cases or do you get seats or how does that work I never travel with my C anymore the orchestra takes care of all that but I the F tube I just I just put it underneath man in a in a flight case and I quit worrying about it a long time ago. I've had that thing damaged so many damn times. I don't even, I don't even think about it. If it gets crushed, it just gets crushed and I'll just get another one, you know, <laughs> that's kind of the reality of it, isn't it? Yeah. Because you, you, you sit there and you're, you know, it just stresses you out and you're, you can't even enjoy the, the travel because you're, you know, so worried about what's going to happen out the other end, you know, and it's just better not to worry about it. Yeah, I enjoyed when uh, Andrew had to have his horn repaired on separate continents uh, multiple times within a short period of time. That was entertaining for me, it but was, not as much. For him. And that's because you're an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was. <laughs> 
all within, I'd argue if I disagreed. All within one. Oh, I, I knew you wouldn't. Uh, all within one month. Yeah. Anchorage, Alaska, Linz, Austria, and Hong Kong that were all like emergency, like have to figure out who the person is in town and go and like drive right there so I can play the gig. Yeah, that was uh, that was right towards the end of my 14 years of traveling. And I was like, I think maybe I should look for the next <laughs> phase of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah before i that's, end mine man, or a, someone else's yeah. <laughs> that's a different world man yeah yeah that was uh that was a little uh that was a little aggressive and i my the favorite my favorite part of that is that the the i guess it was the middle one uh lens where we were actually in what Olsdorf, i think we were um we were we were doing there was like a, a brass festival. There's this gorgeous concert hall in this tiny town that was the middle of nowhere. It was like all cow pastures in this little town center in this beautiful beautiful concert hall. And they had like this two day brass festival and uh, the first day was Boston brass, the second day was Minozal brass. It was amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um but we yeah. we were outside of <clears throat> Linz by I don't know, forty five minutes or an hour, something like that. And um and I needed to get a ride in and there was some guy who was so nice he he like gave up like four hours of his life to just drive me in but he didn't speak any English and so the two of us just like sat in yeah we just sat quietly in the car as we went for an hour and then we sat quietly at this shopping mall while we waited for my tuba to get fixed and then we sat quietly on the ride home and then I thanked him profusely and and he smiled and um, yeah it was kind of. <laughs> It's kind of funny. It was like we were both on the bus, except the bus was just two of us, <laughs> and it was inside of his car. So, yeah, but uh, but I, I don't he, know. He, he wasn't the uh, he wasn't the mute maker, was he? No, this was just oh a. My um, God, that would be awesome, wouldn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> this was just some random dude who lived in uh, Olsdorf, who was like friends with the presenter kind of thing, who had a car and was like, "Sure, I can put up with an American for four hours," <laughs> which isn't oh, necessarily, okay. isn't necessarily a given. So. But, um, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it can be hard, but you've got the right attitude. It can be hard to kind of let go like that though. You know, it's like, cause the, yeah, you're going to, you're going to get the tuba on the other end and it's going to look like it looks and we'll just, yeah, you got to then go from there. So what's the worst damage that yeah, ever exactly. happened to your tuba? Oh, oh, two, probably two different ones. My, uh, one of my old, um, BNS, uh, Cynthia models, one I really liked a lot, uh, the, they uh, put it in the case upside down. I don't know. I don't even know how oh. they did it. And then they just made it fit <laughs> by push, you know, just put the lace. Some, some big ass, dumb ass must have laid on the thing just to get it locked down. And so I, I, I pulled it out of the, you know, I got, I can't remember where I was at, Texas somewhere. And I pulled it out of the case and it was just destroyed. You know, I'm like, I'm just and I was just in awe that they actually got it in the case. Right. It was a molded case, right? That's what I'm, they, that's why I'm laughing. Out how to smash it. Yeah, it was incredible. <laughs> and then the other time, me and Jessica, we were uh, flying back to Stockholm, and and uh, we, you know, the little train or whatever it's called that gets all the luggage. Well, he they just loaded it up, and he uh, whipped it around like a little U-turn, and we saw the the uh, flight case from my nurse will just go shooting out the side of this little, you know. <laughs> nice. You know, do, 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 only across the runway. <laughs> and I thought, oh, hell. <laughs> so I got it home the next morning. All right, no, I got I took it. When I got home, I, I pulled it out of the case and looked at it. I was like, oh, shit, it, it made it. That's a pretty good case. I like this case. And then um, the next morning, I pulled it out to do a routine, and I played a little bit, and I put it down on the bell. You know, he set it on the bell, and, and it kept falling over. I was like, what in the hell is going on here? So I, I picked it up. And then if you look at it, you know, just right, they had basically just twisted that bell. Oh. Oh. So it was, you know, I took it to the repairman. He was like, man, you can't fix this thing. You might as well just buy a new bell. Jeez. Actually, you so know I what? It. I have a new theory <laughs> that baggage handlers are frustrated trumpet players. <laughs> So they just well, abuse tubas. They just well. Oh, here comes a tuba. <laughs> I yeah. don't. I don't remember what inspired this, but just just yesterday, I was telling somebody about about every once in a while, uh, my tuba 
uh, used to be in the my exotuba in the case was just over fifty pounds, and you know for a long time it was seventy, and then it dropped to fifty, the the weight limit to not get charged an asinine amount of money. And since it was like fifty three pounds, they would always, you know, I, I would frequently get the question would say, well, you know, is there anything that you can take out of this to get it under fifty pounds? And I would always say, well, I could take the the tuba out, but then I don't think they'll pay me. <laughs> <laughs> and, I would, and I would, and I would get like half the time I would get like a chuckle, like oh okay, and then the other half of the time I would just get a completely blank stare back, which is why I kept saying that line because it was always funny to me when they were just like, "There is no humor here at the airport." <laughs> it's like, okay. and it wasn't no. a, it wasn't a bomb <laughs> joke. It was just yeah. like, yeah, if I take the instrument out, I don't I don't think that they're gonna want me to just stand there and look pretty. So. Um, no, they don't like that kind of stuff. No, they, <laughs> they, it, turns out, it turns out they don't. So I want to ask you uh, about, uh, about auditions and taking auditions because when someone has won as many as you have, then you have figured something out. So what is your approach to auditions and why do you think – well, I mean, you're an amazing – musician and you're an amazing tuba operator but that still doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to win this many auditions because there's a trick to them and they're just they're their own beast so can you give us some insights into your approach to auditions well yeah uh, it's it's changed man so many times over the years but i think what really started to work for me is when i switched from being physically prepared to mentally prepared because i mean i could I mean, of course, at some point in your your career or your development, you have to learn the excerpts and all that good stuff. But, you know, I always joke around that I'm going to write a, a book, and this is going to piss off, like, maybe some people. But I was going to write a book, Death of American Brass Playing, based on the three Ts. But, uh, you know, tone, time, tuning, because that's all I used to think about, because that's all I was – you know, fed, man, like tone, time, tune, you know, you just had to work on that. And it's, and I think just what, what changed for me was I stopped worrying about the three T's and I started to first mentally prepare where I was so mentally strong that didn't matter what happened on that day that I did, I did not waver from what I was there to do. Mm. And the second thing was, I started to associate every excerpt with emotions instead of these. Yeah, I'm trying to say this one again. But yeah, just really apply some sort of emotion that I have to each excerpt. What can I? What can I draw out of my how many years at that point I've been on Earth? can I apply to this excerpt to make these people feel a connection with me? And man, that emotional connection is what, what gets you further in life. You know I mean? The moment you emotionally connect with somebody, you feel like, you know, them and you, you start pulling for them. You know what I mean? And, Mm -hmm. And that's really hard to do if you're only focused on tone, time and tuning, you miss that musical emotional connection. Hmm. And so I just, stop worrying about that. And, you know, I run a lot and I almost run, I run. So, you know, before an audition, like say 30 days out, I, every, you know, let's say it takes me 45 minutes to an hour to, to run that whole time. I'm going through the audition process, the, you know, from waking up in whatever city, of course, at that point I knew, know what city I'm going to. So I'm waking up. I feel like this, uh, I take a cab the next day I walk the you know, next day, whatever, you know, but it's the scenarios always change. And I get there, they have it's an alphabetical order. I get there and they make us draw numbers or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I go, I, I make these scenarios of my head every day, but the, the, what I always do or, you know, will still do is, uh, at the end of the run, you know, when I finish that audition process in my head, the only thing that stays the same is that that proctor, that monitor, that that personnel manager, whoever, she or he comes out and and says, "Thanks everybody for coming, but today we liked offer the job to Tim Busby," you know, and and that fuels you, man. That that those little small wins, even 
if you're just going through it in your head, just gives you this confidence and drive, you know, and it's for me anyways. And so by the time I finally got to the audition, you know, these auditions, you know, I'd already taken the audition 30 times before I showed up. So it didn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what they, what they throw at me. I'm, I'm ready for it, you know? And I, and I know I'm going to win. And, you know, the other thing is like, people get so upset when they don't win something. And that, that's not saying that I want every one that I prepare like that. But the difference is, is that after the audition, even if I lost, I knew, I knew that I did all I could. I, I played the best I could and I was mentally prepared. And it wasn't like one of these things where, you, you know, you just like, what happened? Shit, I should have won this, man. You know, you, you hear all these people at the bar afterwards, you know, after a few beers, you know, mm-hmm. he sucked. She sucks, man. I should have won this, you know, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Right. But, you know, when you, you, so you don't have this huge letdown that a lot of people do after auditions where you just feel gutted and then you have to rebuild everything. It's like you feel like you won even though you didn't. And, mm-hmm. and it's such a healthier – because, man, auditions – I mean, to be honest, I kind of love auditions. I, I like Jessica always. Well, she never lets me go to any more auditions. I want to go to all of them just to, you know, see if I can win. But uh, <laughs> she she won't let me. She's afraid. She's afraid we'll move. You know? But no. But, <laughs> but I, I kind of love it. But you know, of course, it's it's a flawed system. No matter where you go, that's the thing. Like Europe has its problems, and you know, America has its problems with its system, and and Asia and, you know, Australia, you know, every, where I've ever been, it, there's not a perfect system. So it's, you know, to, to find a, a, a routine or a process that you can kill as many birds with one stone as possible is the, is the key is the way I started to look at it, you know, cause if you're going to be taking auditions everywhere, you don't want to be changed in your process on every place. You need to find a, one process that works everywhere. And I think the emotional connection and that, that musical connection is, is what did it for me. You, you, um, it was really fascinating to me cause I did, uh, I've won one major audition. So it was a, n- nothing to compare that way, but the, the process was exactly the same, almost verbatim. Like you were saying things that I have heard come out of my own mouth in terms of, the uh, the mental process that you went through and the various um, scenarios that you ran through. So where where did you how did you develop that? I'm trying to figure out if we overlapped in some way pedagogically. Like did we? I know we haven't crossed paths, but like it's spooky to me how similar those things are. Um, so where did, um, how did you develop that? Well, well, it, uh, t- to be honest, it started, I read this book, and shit, I'm going to forget the guy's name, but uh, Unleash the Warrior Within. It's mm. a um, na- Navy SEAL who wrote this book about focus and and um, the process that he goes through to achieve some of these missions that he, you know, that he was put, you know, put in. And, and I just started, I could relate all of that to auditions and just life in general, you know, this kind of stuff. So it kind of started with that book. And I just, I would read that book all the time and just try to find things that I could use from that book to get me further and anything that I was wanting to achieve. And then, and then of course, meeting Jessica and just hearing, like I told you earlier, just hearing the, how she approached, you know, music was just a total different way that I, I thought about it. You know, it was, and that, that's a little bit of a European difference between America, you know, like, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't go to school and they don't have all their excerpts memorized, you know, <laughs> they, they have to pull out, you know, even the ride, like, Hey, let's, can we play the ride together? Oh, let me get my music. And you're like, look at what <laughs> you, you need music for the ride. But, but then they can, you know, then they can play the David and the Grindel and the, you know, all these solos by memory, the whole thing, you know? So, it was just a very different uh, way of thinking as far as the solos. And then if you can apply that, that soloistic more type of sound or, or you know, the, the shape and the colors and all of that, and you can apply it to the excerpts. <clears throat> you know, I always say, you know, this, everybody knows Gene's CD, you know, like that CD that came out in the mid-90s, the orchestral CD. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, he, he talks about the, the, the Prokofiev Romeo and Juliet, which we're doing this next week. The only reason it was on my mind, but, uh, you know, this is the last, I remember, you know, I can hear his voice. This is the last time that, you know, Romeo and Juliet, you know, will see each other, blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And so you have to portray that in the music. And that's right. But for me, that's, that's still a little bit generic, man. Like, if you really want to put it in perspective, I mean, like, like my students, when they come and play that thing, I, you know, I say, look, do you love your mama? And they're like, yeah, of course I love my mama. Well, imagine if I looked at you right now and said, you get two minutes to call your mom right now and tell her everything you want to tell her, and that's the last time you'll ever talk to her. Mm. You know, then it's a very different story, man. Like, so it's not just these two people that you've heard about your whole life, Romeo and Juliet. You know, I mean, this is like, it's real now. It's like me telling my little daughter goodbye and walking out of the door and never know that I never get to say another word to her. I mean, it, it you know, makes me emotional as hell to even think about mm-hmm. it. So, and then if I can apply that feeling to that little solo or whatever solo you're, you're trying to, you know, get across to the audience, then it becomes something a lot different than just, two people that you've never met in your life. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know, man. I, that's, so I just, I don't know. I slowly just came up with it, you know, on my own. And, uh, it was a lot to do with the weight loss, you know, cause I lost a shitload of weight and, and, you know, I kind of applied that to, to doing that too, you know, just the whole running every day and all that stuff and being very focused and having that real strong mental image of what I was going for. And, and how I was going to achieve it. And that I think th- maybe that progressed, you know, it's just slowly, man, like anything. I guess. Mm-hmm. There you go. Wow. Intense. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's great. You're right. We're all, we're all just storytellers, right? And it just depends on what the story is and, and the, I mean, great actors and they, yeah, they dig deep and they relate it to things personal or, you know, real or perceived, but, uh, but they become the thing that they're trying to, you know the the character they're trying to betray to to betray, uh, to portray, betray. Yeah. What well, depends on the role. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> uh, and that's yeah, that's that's intense. There you go. Um, cool. Well, we are yeah. uh, we are just about out of time yeah. here. But uh, but someone as enlightened as you with all of this like visualization mm-hmm. and like imagine taking the cab to the audition and walking to the audition in alphabetical order and pulling numbers from a hat and all of the above. Uh, you're a you're a, a thinking man's thinker, and so I think that you are going to be possibly uniquely positioned to help our dear friend Jens Lindemann with this uh, amazing uh, bout he's having with chop problems that are going on for almost five years now. So, what advice, Tim, would you yeah, give that. to Jens? Oh well, after all of that emotional outlet that I just had. <laughs> The only thing I could come up with, and this this may go a little bit too deep Uh-oh. for ends, <laughs> but I think the you know the the best advice I could give Yens would be just retirement's nice. <laughs> just, just sometimes just know when to say when. It's it's better for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so just hang it up. Just hang it up, buddy. I mean, we'll, you know, no hard feelings. You know, we support you. <laughs> should and uh should we you... know you, you know, you can have a, a you're still young enough where you can have a modeling career. <laughs> <laughs> So, so <laughs> okay, that one hurt a little bit. So <laughs> hang it up. So, so, no, I did not I expect that probably. last curveball. Yeah, exactly. So you think you should hang it up for a modeling career? Oh, he's. A, I mean, I guess he's a pretty good looking guy. He's hand model. Back. He's a good model. <laughs> Canadian hand model. <laughs> Canadian hand model, man. Yep. There must not be many of those. <laughs> <laughs> Like, Tim is so enlightened. He's even finding his next career niche for him. Yeah, there you go. Um, I I like it, man. Well, I I may or may not have had a, a texting conversation with Jens recently, where he was uh, he was talking about possibly uh, 
<laughs> uh, possibly making short videos of him trying all of these uh, remedies that have been suggested by famous brass players <laughs> around the world. So now I really want to see him do a video of him retiring, like putting the trumpet in the case, closing it, and then displaying his hand modeling skills. <laughs> mm-hmm. that one, did he present that? Awesome. Did he present that idea as his own? I <laughs> Because that was his wife's idea. No, he let the record state. <laughs> I think he might have mentioned uh, Jen in that text, but I'm going to pretend like he didn't because it's funnier if we just bust on him for stealing her idea. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so nope, he didn't. He, he didn't mention her at all. So, uh, there you go. So, so go transition from a trumpet mega superstar to Canadian hand model. So, see, that's that. Tim's an, oh, he's an, you're an enlightened dude, man. You're like, you've got the compassion. You're like, hang it up. But here's this other way that you can impact the world. Yeah. it's like, you know, it's like you're next and yeah. you're, you're still young enough and you're a pretty good looking dude. I like, <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Anything to help. Yep. Anything to help. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, and the world needs hand models now more than ever. Cause like you pointed out before the internet picture is just like, I mean, it just instantly loads. So. Um, yeah, we can plow through a lot and, more pictures. And than, trumpet, but. Yeah, <laughs> they do love seeing pictures of themselves. <laughs> so, but I've said too much. All right. Well, uh, Tim is going to uh, hang out for the bonus episode for our Patreon patrons. If you go to patreon.com slash the brass junkies uh, for as little as $1 per episode, you can get access to uh, to bonus episodes with every guest that we have, and um, and that is going to include Tim here. So, Tim, thank you so much for staying up past midnight to uh, to to join us. Uh, this has been really great. No problem, guys. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank All you. right, and that is going to do it for another episode of the Brass Junkies. You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to hear the bonus episode featuring today's guest, please visit patreon.com slash thebrassjunkies to learn how you can support the show and instantly access all bonus materials as well as gain access to a special patron-only Facebook group. The Brass Junkies is produced by the amazing, wonderful, and truly inspirational Will Houchen. The theme music was composed by Fernando Dados and performed by Andrew Hitz and Lance Ledoux. Duke. We are at Pray for Yens on Twitter and Instagram and have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash pray for Yens. You can find out more about the Brass Junkies and all the other Pedal Note Media podcasts at pedalnotemedia.com. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.